housing tax credit, public housing, we'll go through the whole list. Uh, you have a lot of protections right now where your landlord cannot evict you for non-payment of rent until July 23rd. In addition to that, there is a provision which is actually has a really, um, doesn't have a sunset clause. So it's actually potentially a pretty large change in instant law right now. But your landlord, the one thing that, that the CARES Act said in the federal moratorium provides is that for any covered property, the landlord cannot issue you a notice to vacate until after July 23rd, and that notice has to be 30 days. The reason why that's significant is one, it says broadly any notice to vacate. Um, initially, people read it to, I'm not sure actually how people read it, to be honest. I've heard different interpretations, but it seems to be exactly what it says, which is Congress said that your landlord cannot demand you to move out regardless of the reason or lack thereof until after July 23rd. And this would seem to say that even during the time period up until July 23rd, even if you were living in one of these properties and you're being accused of behavior that has happened during the moratorium, um, that Congress is saying that your landlord cannot demand you move out until after July 23rd. And that even after that, even after July 23rd and in perpetuity, if your landlord and you reside in one of these covered properties and you're asked to move out, you have to be given 30 days notice regardless of the cause. This is a pretty substantial change that people are still processing and digesting exactly how it's going to work. But it seems to be that Congress has actually created a whole nother um, area of uh, practice and sort of procedural rights for certain tenants. So just to reiterate in these properties, one, we you know that your landlord can definitely not evict you for rent until after July 23rd. And the only types of behavior cases it seems to be, at least in reading the, the laws that the, that the landlord can raise against you is stuff that they had already started or commenced or already notified you about prior to the enactment date on March 23rd. So if your landlord had given you a notice prior to March 23rd, you live in one of these properties, you maybe potentially could have a case filed against you right now for eviction, although you won't because of the state law, although we'll talk about that. But that generally it seems that most even behavior issues that come up now for whatever it is, potentially you are protected until after July 23rd. Short of it though, is you should talk to an attorney um, to be able to sort of go through it uh, because we're still sort of making our waves into this new land that we have found ourselves by the CARES Act. Uh, so the first thing, I'm not sure what I'm doing. Okay. So these are federally subsidized properties, and I'll talk about the federal mortgage backed or the federally backed properties and how to find out maybe some information about them. But as you can tell, it's a lot of programs. A lot of people, when they think of federally subsidized programs, they maybe think of Section 8 um, or maybe public housing or probably the most common one here, which is the loan income housing tax credit at the bottom. Whoops. Um, so the low income, low income housing tax credit is probably the most common subsidy or affordable housing that you're going to find. It usually means you live in a privately developed um, property and if you recertify your income every year that's probably a good hint that you live in one of those or maybe some other type of federally subsidized property but it's a lot and it also under the for example the McKinney Vento Act homelessness programs it potentially has a far reach into some of the shelter or transitional housing providers as well um, but generally if you have a section 8 voucher or if you have some kind of federally subs um, federal subsidy you should be protected by this act meaning you can't be evicted for rent at least until after July 23rd and really probably cannot be asked to vacate for any reason until after July 23rd and you should be given a 30-day notice after that how do you find out if you live in a federally subsidized unit um, the first place is to go to preservationdatabase.org I would say it's 90% of the time pretty accurate um, but if you don't find it there, it doesn't necessarily mean you're not in a federally subsidized unit. It maybe just doesn't show up on that database. A lot of tax credit properties, for example, do not show up on the preservation database. It's a national database that's, um, that's supposed to show all the affordable housing. Instead, you probably want to go to the Washington Housing Finance Commission's website. They have an Excel spreadsheet for their low-income housing tax credits, which lists every single housing tax credit building that's in the state. Even if you live in one of those units though, in one of those buildings, it doesn't necessarily mean you get the tax credit. Um, there's also another ambiguity in the actual law itself where it seems to say that if your landlord has rented out to a single section eight tenant in the building, that actually the whole building's covered by it. I don't know, that's literally what the law says, but that's perhaps, I don't know, 
how exactly courts are going to interpret it. That said, you just definitely want to have this on your radar um, if this is something that's coming up too. So the other ones are the federally backed properties, and they're also covered by the federally um, the, the federal moratorium. And it can be a lot harder to figure out if you live in a property that's covered by this. So what do I mean by federally backed? It's basically your landlord's taking on a mortgage and it's either insured or backed by the federal government in some capacity. Um, sometimes that's a VA uh, loan that might be attached to it. So it's the Veterans Affairs might actually have the information on it. There's also um, potentially it's the case that Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae are involved in it, which can usually be a sign that this is actually federally backed. Um, the first link that we have there is from the National Low Income Housing Coalition, and they've put together a non-exhaustive list of multifamily buildings. So if you live in a large building um, and you're wondering if it's federally backed, it's, it's one of the lists you can go to and you can see a bunch of the Seattle properties. There's also Seattle Times has done some research on this. I have been told that the rental market is, especially the large buildings, that is those with more than four units, about half the rental market is federally backed or has some kind of mortgage attached to it in this nature. So that it's good chance if you live in a big building, at least one in two chance, that you live in a property that has some kind of, that is protected under the federal moratorium. Um, it's also one of the things that can be a little bit harder is if you live in a small building, so you have less than four units, or you live in a single family property, it can be really hard to find out if you live in one of these federally backed mortgage properties. You can call Fannie Mae, you can call Freddie Mac, they might tell you or they might not tell you. Some of the representatives are pretty free, uh, are freely giving away the information from by people who are calling and saying, I'm a tenant, I want to know if I'm in one of these properties. And the representative is willing to give that information. Um, other times, the representative is shutting that down and saying, nope, I cannot give that information to you unless you're the actual um, owner of the property or the one who took out the mortgage. There is also on Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae's websites, there is like a loan lookup. You do need the social security number, though, for the uh, loan holder, the one who took out the mortgage. So unless you have your landlord's social security number, which I don't know about you, but I don't have mine. Um, I mean, my landlords, I have my own, but um, that you probably won't be able to get that type of information. The one obviously obvious rule though, to know that if you are qualified or if you're protected by this moratorium or not is if your landlord owns the mortgage outright. Um, maybe uh, you can get that information or not. Sometimes if you look at the county land records where you live, you might be able to see this information. Other times you won't. Um, but if your landlord does own the property outright and doesn't have a mortgage, they're definitely not falling in this category. And in which case, it just matters whether you have a subsidy or not. So I don't know if there's questions, though, on the federal moratorium here. Yeah, if there's questions, um, you can do the whole little raising your hand thing that Zoom lets you do. Or you can shoot me a question in the chat or just, I guess, unmute yourself <laughs> if you're able to. Um, so I'm not seeing anybody pop up. So Ed, why don't you keep on going? All right, and then so next we come to the state moratorium, which for the most part for everyone is probably the more urgent and more important one that provides greater protections in the federal moratorium in any case. Um, so it's probably not something you really need. You don't, even if you're under the federal moratorium or you're wondering about it, really it's not a problem until after June 4th uh, when that, when the state moratorium goes up, unless it gets extended for any reason, or you live in a city where they've extended it, although no city has extended their moratorium past June 4th. So right now, for the most part, uh, um, we don't need to care too much about the local ones at this point. But the state moratorium was really broad. It actually has some retroactive pieces to it. Um, the first part is until June 4th, it pretty much bars every single kind of eviction and notice to vacate anything of your landlord telling you to get out until June 4th. With the one exception is unless the acts of the tenant are a significant immediate risk to health and safety. So if the only problems you're having right now as a tenant are you're behind on your rent, you have a dog, you're not supposed to have a dog, um, unless that dog is hurting people, um, or you're having guests you're not supposed to have, you should not be asked to move out. You should not be um, 
force into an eviction case or get any type of summons at that point. Your landlord's barred from trying to enforce any notice, trying to issue any notice. Um, and even if you've gone to court and lost and you already have an eviction that's been ordered right now, no evictions are to take place until June 4th. Right now, no sheriffs who, who carry out the evictions in every county in the state of Washington are allowed to execute a single eviction until June 4th. So it doesn't matter whether you've moved out, it doesn't matter whether you have an order from the court. Right now, everyone, unless you are, unless you are constituting an imminent risk to the health and safety of the neighbors or the landlord, um, you probably have nothing to worry about until June 4th. So that's kind of the easy one is, does anybody have to worry about eviction? No, the simple answer is no right now regardless of the status, regardless of where you are, even if your lease is expired and you're holding over, you cannot be forced out of your home until after June 4th. Um, unless you create, unless there's an imminent risk to health and safety. Um, I, you know, I haven't seen too many cases yet come up in that regard. I haven't seen too many landlords try to use that loophole. I don't know if they might be tempted to under this, but who knows. But right now, everyone should be secure, at least as far as being able to stay in their homes the exception of that uh, risk to health and safety. In addition, it went backwards. So the original order that was issued on March 16th said nothing about late fees. And it said late fees are um, still allowed to be accrued, although the landlord was not allowed to evict a tenant for rent. Um, late fees would still accrue. This order went backwards and said from February 29th to June 4th, there should be no late fees accrued during the time due to non-payment of rent. So it kind of revised that a little bit more. Um, and so we get a little bit of a better situation as far as you know, the only thing that right now people have to worry about at the end of June 4th is whether they have the rent or not. They shouldn't have to worry about late fees or any type of interest or anything else accruing at that time. Um, in addition, there is a little bit of a slightly vague piece, although I, I think I have a feeling how the attorney general is gonna probably interpret it, which is no increases on rent or deposits during the time period. Um, this didn't, notably did not have a retroactive piece to it. It didn't say any increases from February 29th to June 4th. So that does suggest that they weren't necessarily referring to increases that had already taken place since the public emergency went into play, unlike the, like, like the issue with the late fees. Um, and I think one of the questions though, the way it's stated, it's not clear if you had received a month ago or two months ago, some type of rent increase, you know, can the landlord increase the rent now? And it's not clear. I really am not sure about the answer. My guess is the attorney general is gonna probably say they cannot, the landlord cannot increase the rent at this time or the deposit, even if they've issued a notice prior to that, but I'm not sure. Maybe somebody has an answer to that or talk to the attorney general about their position um, or even what the governor intended. But at the least, what I can say is that right now your landlord cannot issue you a notice until June 4th paying your rent will be increased prospectively. So generally in, in Washington state, your landlord has to give you 60 days notice prior to doing any type of rent increase, which would mean your landlord is not gonna be able to increase the rent until most likely August, until really September 1st, if you're on a month to month situation where you pay at the end of the month. So you shouldn't be seeing any rent increases at least until September 1st, realistically. Um, August 5th would be the earliest by all means that I think that the landlord could increase it. And that's if you're not on a term month to month at that point. Um, so the other thing too, is it applies to all types of residencies, which we'll talk about. It's much broader. It was in, its intent was to sort of include everyone who basically relies on that place as their home. Another little interesting tidbit that was in there, and I wish it was a little bit clearer as well, which is that the landlord is not allowed to report the information or treat it as debt. Basically, if you're not paying your rent, they can't, um, your landlord cannot treat it as unpaid to report it to a debt collector until they've offered you an individualized payment plan based on your financial health. Um, we, I had some talk with the attorney general because it was not really clear to me exactly what was, how this was supposed to work and there were different types of readings here. What they've told me, what was the intent from the governor was that the landlord from the debt, any debt that's accrued from February 29th to June 4th, um, that any type of rent during that time, the landlord cannot commence an eviction collection action until they've offered a payment plan. And that will extend even after the order is lifted on June 4th so that 
if, for example, you have you find yourself an eviction case in July, one of your defenses then might be that the landlord did not offer you an individualized payment plan for any rent that accrued from February 29th to June 4th. Now, if you also owe July's rent, it's not going to be included in that individualized payment plan. But if you do owe any money from that time period, understand um, your landlord has to at least, at least according to the attorney general, provide that individual payment plan before they even start the collections action. So they can't even issue you a 14-day notice. They can't issue you or report it to a debt or treat it as unpaid until they've actually had that sort of individualized treatment. There's a lot of questions about what that means. Um, I will say, I mean, we can talk a little bit more, and I think it's more at this point better to have the discussion, but, um, you know, what is it, uh, what is an individualized payment plan? For example, I don't think a landlord would be able to, to issue a notice to everyone and say, this is what we're offering. You can pay back your first month's rent in three months. You can pay your, if you have two months, you can offer it. You can pay it in five months. Anything that's not, because it's not individualized, they won't be able to issue blanket plans. They have to at least engage with the individual tenant um, to be able to actually sort of diagnose what's your circumstances, what are you going when are you going to pay, what are you going to be able to pay, um, and really kind of situate it based on that. So if the landlord refuses to do that individualized treatment, it's probably going to be a problem for the landlord down the road because they won't be able to actually carry out any type of eviction or collection action. Where the tenant might get in trouble is if, let's say, the landlord does issue out that notice to every single tenant saying, hey, we're willing to do individualized payment plans per the governor's order, let's talk, and then the tenant does nothing, does not engage with it, I think the court is going to say it's the tenant who refused to engage in the process. So the important thing here is to engage with your landlord at this point. Now, there's also this big problem is what if you have no income whatsoever? What if June 4th comes around and you owe and you have no income, you can't pay anything, so there is really no situation, at least at this moment, that you can predictably say, I can actually pay anything off. What's supposed to happen there? And the answer is, I don't know for a fact. My guess is probably under this order, a court is probably going to allow an eviction to proceed if you indicate to the landlord you have no ability to pay whatsoever at this time, unless there's like something. I mean, some type of hopeful perspective message you can give to your landlord saying, I don't have a job maybe right now that I can pay you, but I can do so maybe on July 1st or so. It's a lot of this is up in the air. It's vague. I think personally, it's kind of, it's good that it's a little bit vague and broad. I think it helps um, us sort of deal with different situations and try to sort of adjust what people need to do after June 4th. Um, that's that I think there's going to be a lot of questions in the next month or so especially after June 4th, about what this all means. Um, and I have a feeling we're probably going to get a little bit more clarity from the governor's office, at least about what exactly is expected here um, of everybody involved, tenants, landlords, et cetera. Um, so like I said, it covers virtually all people, um, almost all types of residential housing types. Um, the intent language really gets you here. It says they really definitely want to include Airbnbs, transitional housing, motels, campgrounds. Um, and the thing is, the problem is that Washington law is just sort of a little bit gray about when does somebody become a residential tenant? Do they have protections? How exactly are guests of motels, for example? Um, what can a hotel owner actually do to be able to evict a motel guest if they overstay? Um, there's a lot of just vague little parts to that. That said, the intent was very clear from the governor, which is that they wanted to protect pretty much every single type of residential setting that you can think of. Uh, and this is really great because the first one really didn't do that. The attorney general was construing it more broadly after the issues were being raised. Um, but the first one, I think, was pretty narrow in what it actually applied to. At best, it applied to residential tenancies, so your typical land or tenant. Um, transactions where you just you have a lease agreement and you're protected under it. Maybe mobile homes, although I didn't personally really see it in there, but it's, I, I think I can use my imagination and the rest were kind of just probably not there. Um, so that said, you know, this is really good because now we have this really solid protection for everyone um, who is any type of tenancy is really kind of getting rid of some of that gray area and just making it so that really no one's supposed to be kicked out of their homes right now, at least for until after June 4th at this point. Um, da, da, da. 
so problems, the attorney general has been uh, prosecuting these. So you can contact the attorney general. I don't know if Sochi can share the form that they want to be used. There's like an online form to file your complaints. So simply put, if you're being charged late fees, you should contact the attorney general. If you get a rent increase, you should contact the attorney general. If your landlord's threatening you with an eviction, you should contact the attorney general. If the landlord gives you a notice to vacate, you should contact the attorney general. If the landlord is asking you to pay something and have not engaged in any type of individual payment plan yet, you should contact the attorney general. So even if you get a notice from the landlord that says, pay your rent, I'm not trying to kick you out, but pay your rent, and they haven't already engaged or asked you about what is your ability to pay, that's a violation of this order as well. So you should contact the attorney general. Um, so it's, I, I know at least as of the other day, I think they've had over 650 complaints so far. And that's just really with the last order. Um, I think with this most recent one, it's definitely going to explode. So I'm not sure exactly what the capacity is gonna be. That said, they are working on a lot of these issues. Um, but if you're having any problems with your landlord, honestly, you probably could probably, it's gonna fall somewhere underneath um, the actual most recent order for the most part. Rule of thumb. So, um, any questions on the state moratorium before we just go into a very quick eviction 101 and what your remedies are in the worst case scenario? Yeah, so why don't we uh, go about it like this? I will ask the questions from the chat and then I will give people on the phone an opportunity to ask some questions and then we'll go back to see if there's any more questions and then we can move forward. So from, I'll start with the chat. So what if uh, the ledger, their rent ledger is showing late or daily late fees um, and the ledger was provided before the, um, the, mor the second moratorium? Well, so they, okay, so they have a prior ledger that shows late fees that have accrued, but now that we have this new order, um, we're, they're wondering like, is there a violation or what to do about that? Essentially is yes. the question. Yes. Um, I, I would probably be hard pressed um, that there's anything to be done about the prior ledger. I think what's gonna have to happen is you'd have to talk to the landlord to amend that ledger to reflect that no late fee is gonna accrue since February 29th. Um, there's an, I, just don't see the violation right now because at the time of existence, it wasn't a violation. Um, but now with the new order, landlords are gonna have to amend their ledgers at this point. So you could definitely request the landlord just to do that. Cool. So the next question, um, do uh, year long leases go month to month during this time if the lease period has ended? Yeah, that's the default rule. There's nothing in specifically that says that the lease would continue from year to year. And specifically, actually, there's a state law that abolishes that unless it's actually a notarized document between the tenant and the landlord. Um, so it'll, once the lease expires, you're basically going to continue month to month at that point. And so you should continue probably at the same rate that you were at. I mean, the, the moratorium, like I said, there is that kind of vague piece about rent increases. So if, for example, back in February or January, your landlord had told you, yeah, at the end of your lease agreement, I'm going to raise your rent. My guess is the attorney general is going to say any increases that go into effect during the moratorium until June 4th are probably not allowed. But it doesn't specifically say that. It's not very clear. It's not so much as it's saying that the landlord cannot increase the rent prospectively. Now, like issue you a notice telling you that in 60 days, your rent's going to go up. Um, or if they can't even allow previously agreed upon or previously notified increases to go into effect um, within the time period up until June 4th. Uh, but so you, but the long story short is you're probably just going to increase, go, go to month to month, and the rent that you pay should be the same amount um, that your lease ended on. What if the tenant, as far as the rent increases go, and I recognize this isn't clear in the moratorium, but if the tenant is signing a new lease and the, the rent for the new lease is going is up higher, like for a 12 month lease. Um, how do you think that is gonna work? So the question is like, let's say the I'm just trying to think of the hypothetical, like the the lease like ends already at April 30th and the tenants signing a new lease that would increase the rent on May 1st. So basically it's a question is can the tenant agree to a rent increase, essentially? Yeah, and that's I don't know the answer to that one. I'm not sure what the attorney general would view that has. It seems to be the governor intended it to be a pretty broad 
um, a pretty broad order to kind of prohibit all activities. And I don't think they would allow a tenant to agree to anything otherwise. You know, whether this comes up, how often it comes up, I'm not sure. I mean, the tenant could try to raise it um, as a problem if they did agree to and they want to back out of it. I can't say for sure whether this is a waivable right. My guess is the attorney general would probably enforce it if the tenant really wanted to push the issue. Um, but otherwise, I, I, it's kind of up in the air. Okay. So um, imminent safety does not include risk of COVID, right? As in this would not be allowed that COVID is a risk to my health and this tenant has COVID, therefore eviction. Yeah, the order very specifically says that um, an imminent risk of health and safety, the landlord, just because a tenant has COVID, isn't, the landlord cannot push or cite that as an imminent health risk to be able to evict or otherwise avoid or evade the actual moratorium order. So if you get COVID, your landlord cannot be coming to you and saying, oh, you have COVID, your health risk, therefore I'm going to um, start pushing for an eviction. That's not allowed under the moratorium. So how would, um, so the next person was saying that they're having issues with their management trying to make up safety reasons to evict. How do you think evictions for health and safety sort of things are going to work right now? I don't know. It, it's not well mapped out within the actual order. It just says that the, the landlord has to post an affidavit. Um, so it kind of sounds like really what the, land, the landlord, if I was like a landlord's attorney and I had a landlord who came to me and said, I really want to evict this tenant. I think they're an imminent health risk. This is why I would say, well, this is what I would do is I would give them that notice, that first notice, which would probably be a three day notice for waste or nuisance activity. And then have them attach an affidavit saying that we're issuing this despite the moratorium because we believe this is an imminent health risk and we are going to go proceed with the eviction. And then if the tenant didn't vacate, I would then probably add, put, attach that affidavit to a summons that was served on it in the filing that was summoned, that was added to it. I would just be adding this affidavit that the moratorium seems to be contemplating, saying that if the landlord thinks the person's an imminent health risk that they want to go for the actual eviction. So it's a little bit unclear, but I think really what it's saying is the landlord, at least at some point, but probably all points of the process, needs to include an affidavit informing the tenant that they are going to proceed with the eviction because of the imminent health risk and stating so um, under some type of sworn declaration indicating that they believe that this is really necessary for the protection of the health and safety at least to be able to avoid any problems with the attorney general at any process during this. Yeah. Okay. So next question. State eviction, the state eviction moratorium would protect rent strikers from evictions, right? Question. Would, would it? Yeah. Yeah. It would until June 4th. So if you um, decided not to pay your rent, I mean, you certainly have that option under this right now. Um, and if, for example, if like the first month you stopped paying was May 1st rent or May's rent, um, and your landlord says, okay, June 5th here, I'm going to start the eviction process. The first thing you should ask for is that individualized payment plan or ask, where is it? Because they can't really treat you any of your rents as unpaid until they've actually engaged in that process. And so just to reiterate, I mean, what does that mean? It means on June 5th, if you haven't paid your rent, you should not get a 14 day notice unless the landlord has engaged in an individualized payment plan process as contacted you, asked, hey, let's talk about how you're going to pay the rent. And as long as you have acted in good faith, I mean, you've really engaged with them and you really try to make something that works um, and really offer them something that works with what your individualized uh, financial health is, you're fine. Until they actually engage with you in that process um, and really work with you on a reasonable plan, um, they really can't proceed forward. So if you, like, for example, your whole building decided to do a rent strike, the landlord is going to have to show that they actually engage with each individual tenant in providing that actual plan. Like I said, though, the one risk I'm a little bit worried about is if the landlord, off, I think if I was running a, a property man, like a, some kind of property, if I was a manager, or if I was counseling a landlord, what I would say is email and contact every single tenant every single day offering them saying hey you want to engage in the process let them know what you let me know what you want to be able to do or what you can do as far as payment and i'm flexible you know let me know 
And as long if I did not hear back from any of those tenants over the next month and June 5th came around, I would probably think you're probably as a landlord in the clear to be able to start the eviction process. So you as a tenant, the important thing to do is if your landlord starts talking to you, you need to engage with them um, and make sure that you're really being proactive at it. It's not a time to necessarily ignore it because I think you're going to potentially shoot yourself in the foot down the road. Yeah, so you can't essentially refuse a payment plan across the board. Yeah, you can't refuse to engage. You can, t you can refuse what the landlords offered you and said it's unreasonable, I can't do it, this is why my financial health is this. But if you just are silent, you don't respond, you don't engage at all, then you are potentially down the road, I think you're gonna end up in, you could end up in a collections action or something like that. The one thing that's kind of unfortunate about the order, um, like let's say today your landlord were to Ish, you know, start, you know, reach out to you and say, hey, tenant, I know you haven't paid your rent so far. Let's do an individual payment plan. And then like a couple of days go by and you do nothing. They don't hear from you. Um, potentially under the order, they could start collection. They can't start an eviction, but they actually could start reporting it to a debt collector based on the actual way the wording of the paragraph works. It says the landlord can't start a collection unless they've engaged an individual payment plan. That, from my conversation with the Attorney General, is not what they intended, but that's just what it says. And it's not like a well-crafted worded paragraph for that, but it does seem to allow a landlord to start the collections action, if not the eviction, as soon as they've actually offered the payment plan, even if that's before June 4th. The Attorney General, though, I think is taking a broader view, which is that it, until June 4th, they can't do anything. It's not what it says, personally, um, although I think most landlords would run a risk if they want to deal with the Attorney General. Um, but still, there are some like problems. But the important thing is, as a tenant, do not ignore those emails, those letters, whatever, those messages from your landlord. I think eventually, I think I'm after June 4th, I will say personally, I think our clinic that works with tenants in eviction, we're going to see a lot of people um, who potentially didn't really know how to respond or they weren't sure about what they were supposed to do at that time. And I think a lot of landlords are just going to try to build up paperwork at this point so that, or paper trail so that they can do it later. So it's probably smart for you to also save any communications you've had with your landlord. Screenshot the text, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I, yeah, and I would try to avoid phone calls unless you think it's productive part of the conversation because you want that email trail. Um, or at least if you're going to have a phone call, I'll try to memorialize it in a follow-up email about what was talked about. Yeah. Okay, is there a recommended time frame for a payment plan, like six months to a year? How does that work? Well, there's none. And, you know, that's good and bad. Um, so it means that none of us really have like a yardstick that we can measure this payment plan against, that we can say this is what a reasonable one, this is what's not a reasonable one. Um, it's really hard to say. Like I said, I mean, that situation where the person has no income right now, what are they supposed to do? Because um, their financial health, it's supposed to be individualized to their financial health. And if you have no ability to pay, is the landlord supposed to then wait until you do? And how long? It's not really clear to me at that point of what exactly the obligations of either the tenant or the landlord are. Um, that said, I mean, one thing to just keep in mind, I mean, we do have at least a letter from the Washington Multifamily Housing Association. They represent the big multifamily buildings where they were telling the city council of Seattle what they thought would be a reasonable payment plan to put in the ordinance that council member Gonzalez was pushing. And I think if I was dealing with a big building, I would say this is probably a good measure if I thought it was helpful. I mean, one thing they said, I think, is that if you owed one month rent, you had three months to pay it. If you had two months rent, you had five months to pay it. I think if it was three or more, you'd have six months to pay it, I think was their rubric. Um, that's not the standard, obviously. It's supposed to be individualized. But I would say if I was in court and I was defending a tenant who was dealing with one of these big buildings and the tenant offered a payment plan that was saying, I'll pay one month over two months or three months, I would definitely point to this letter and say, even the landlord groups are saying that's a reasonable plan, frankly, that that was what they recommended as being reasonable, at least to give us some idea of what landlords at least are expecting, at least from their members. Um, or at least they're telling their members to do. 
But that said, it's really up in the air. There's no real rule. And I think that the important thing is really just to engage in the process at this point and try to be both good faith actors. If your landlord's acting in bad faith, then hopefully you have the email trail that really is going to show that. But they're just not really working with you. Um, but you really want to be someone who's trying to be transparent, who's really trying to show them what your individual financial health is. Um, and you really want to try to get to that point where everyone's doing a satisfactory or working with something that works for everyone. So could you potentially do a payment plan that says, um, you know, as soon as my unemployment comes through, I will start paying X, Y, or Z, like to, to have a payment plan that has, doesn't have a specific start date? Yeah, I think so. I think that's a pretty fair assessment. I mean, we know that like with unemployment, it's eventually going to come. I mean, I think where you have a bigger problem is with somebody who's like just not sure when they're going to go back to work at all. And they say, I have some job applications and I don't know. But unemployment, I mean, we know that that's eventually going to happen. You're either entitled to it or you're not. Um, so making promises or setting your dates based on that, I think is a pretty fair assumption and I think is pretty reasonable. Um, but his, where it gets a little bit more complicated is like, well, sometimes there's even going to be a debate about how much is owed, which is one thing that every single tenant and every landlord is going to have to get to, too, which is figuring out what's the amount that actually this person owes, especially when we start getting rid of all the late fees and other charges um, and making sure that those are not being factored into the actual payment plan either. Okay, cool. So undocumented communities may be leery of contacting the attorney general's office. Are there any other alternatives? Um, you could definitely, I mean, for example, if you're in King County, I mean, you could contact my program, which is a housing justice project. Um, we, I mean, we're a non-governmental entity, so we don't share any information with any other entity um, or any personal identifying information for anything. So you could do that if you want. You could also just get assessment of you know, what your rights are. I will say the attorney general's office is pretty good about not sharing information um, with any other governmental entity. Um, and I know that they are pretty conscientious of the issue that, and they are aware of the fact that undocumented persons do sometimes have issues with call, contacting government entities and maybe are leery of doing so. That said, I understand too the hesitation um, so if you do just want to talk to a private attorney, you can talk to us, um, we're free, uh, and you can just get a consultation and use some information, um, and potentially we can also do the contact or direct contact with the attorney general as well, if that's necessary, um, because you don't necessarily need the attorney general to enforce it, it's just one avenue. You could potentially have another attorney or a private attorney enforce the moratorium as well. Cool. And I uh, just put in the chat the link to Ed's program. They're doing um, like a hotline right now. So if you have a very, very like specific situation that you want um, some legal advice on, give them a call. So next question is, what if the landlord retaliates against the tenant? How can the, what can happen both during the moratorium as well as after? I, I guess it depends on what you mean by retaliate. Um, and what exactly the issue is. So the reality is I don't think there's much a landlord can do to exercise power over a tenant under this order that would not violate the order. I mean, so really, realistically, what happens if you violate the order is potentially a misdemeanor um, that could be prosecuted, um, potentially with also civil penalties and fines. So if the landlord is doing anything that's adverse to the tenant, my guess is going to be seen as a violation, um, regardless of what it is um, of this order. And then potentially it's going to be prosecutable by the attorney general's office at that point, or potentially even the district attorney, because it is a state law that's enforceable by them as well. Okay, cool. Um, does this also include utilities, the eviction moratorium? A building was just bought and now utilities must be paid by individual units. Is that a violation? Well, the one thing is, so it doesn't define rent. Rent though is defined by general state law to include utilities. So if, for example, if your landlord is threatening you to evict you or threatening any type of collection activity or demanding payment of utilities, um, that's rent under general state law. And I, I think there's no reason to say, think that the governor intended a different definition. There are some also, if you independently are paying to your utility company, there are some shut off rules as well. I mean, generally utilities are not being shut off for the most part. 
Um, I'm not sure about the statewide level of what the governor's done on utilities. I know locally Seattle has some utility shut off prohibitions. Um, so that generally you shouldn't be seeing your services being turned off if you're paying them directly to the actual utility company. Um, but your landlord still, though, cannot demand any individual utility payments paid to them at this point, or they can't try to treat it as unpaid at this point until after June 4th. And again, it's going to be the same rule. Even if you owe utilities, they can't start anything against you until they've actually started a payment plan. Just because rent is broadly defined as anything that really you have to pay to keep the roof over your head. Yeah, and um, I know like there's a lot of different companies that have, um, or a lot of utilities that have either like figured out, you know, um, prohibitions against shutoffs and things like that. Um, I will say P PSEE, which is a private entity, um, is offering bill assistance. So I just sent, put that link into the chat. Okay, so the next question. What do I do if my management is attempting to evict me based on false allegations? I can prove, but they refuse. I'm assuming prove that it's false, um, but they refuse to engage with me. So right now the landlord is, in, is accusing of like some kind of misbehavior or lease violation potentially or? Um, if, if the person that asked this question wants to um, briefly explain, but, or if not, it's up, it's. Yeah, um, it's, I just randomly got a bunch um, that was super illegal. Um, and uh, I know some law stuff and uh, they claimed a bunch of stuff and things that I hadn't heard of, some stuff that I had already um, sent them emails about. Um, it was about uh, the entirety of the pandemic, basically. Um, it's clear that they're going to try and move toward an eviction. I looked in Section 8 um, called Q Law um, and tried to get as much information as possible. They now will not answer my phone calls or my emails. Um, and I have attempted to send cease and desist. They won't respond to those either. I also have a house full of ants currently. That's why I walked away a few minutes ago. I think that's how my, my mic got turned back on. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure what to do. Well, I mean, we can definitely talk a little bit more about your situation um, offline, but I, I would just say in general is that, I mean, right now your landlord can't do much about it um, as far as like trying to move forward with any type of eviction, unless again, they allege that it's an imminent safety risk. My guess is probably not a land, not a lot of landlords are going to try to access that type of exception. Um, but in any case, if they're spreading like false allegations and making statements to other parties or other persons. Potentially there's defamation issues if they're alleging false issues. Um, so that's potentially a personal injury claim. If they're otherwise uh, threatening you with an eviction at this time, I mean, it's definitely something to contact the Attorney General's office about if you haven't done so already. The next question. Um, if your lease ends in April, are you required to sign a new lease during this time? No, it doesn't say that. Nothing in the order compels you at that point. Your landlord can't otherwise force you to do so. Um, it's hard to say what the environment's going to be like, though, after June 4th, when what's, um, or if, especially if you're not in one of the federally covered properties, um, because it's going to be, it's kind of just, we don't know is there going to be sort of some kind of micro retaliation going on by landlords for tenants who aren't really willing to work with them? So if the only thing that right now is like you're on, you're good with your rent and maybe just for independent of all this, you're like, you know, my lease is up at April 30th. I didn't really want to do another year anyways. Like I was just refusing to do that, but now I'm kind of stuck in this position right now under the terms of the order you're pretty much just going to get rolled over to month to month tenancy at that point and unless your lease says you have to give 30 days notice or 60 days notice in advance before you actually move out you probably just have to give 20 days notice before the end of the month um, that you want to leave so for example if you were thinking like my lease is up on april 30th and i'm going to move out at the end of may or june 1st you just need to give probably 20 days notice right now most likely but check your lease sometimes the lease will provide for a longer period of time and just tell them i'm going to be out on april 31st at the end of the month but i'll pay my rent just as i did for the same amount that i did for april um so your landlord cannot compel you to sign a new lease you're probably all everyone's going to probably be 
pushed into basically month to month for the most part. I think you kind of, the order doesn't say so explicitly, but I think we kind of get to the point where everyone, nobody's really going to be forced to vacate just because their lease expired. I think everyone's going to basically be rolled over to month to month for the most part. I think that's kind of legally the only consequence that I can really think of of all this. Um, there might be some intrepid landlords out there who say, well, I didn't take rent from you after April 31st or April 30th. I didn't, and your lease expired then. I didn't even ask you for rent. So now I'm just going to move to evict you after June 4th. Um, it's, if you don't pay any rent, generally the rule is that you just don't have any rights. Generally, if your lease expired and you don't pay rent after that period, you don't convert to month to month. But I have a feeling I'm not gonna, we're not going to see too many of those cases. And for the most part, as long as you just keep paying your rent, even at the last level that you were, you should be okay. You'll probably be just a month to month tenant at that point. So you don't necessarily have to sign it. Cool. Does criminal activity fall into health and safety for the, under the moratorium? Um, it depends. I mean, so if your criminal activity is like you're violating trademark laws by printing counterfeit NFL shirts in your or jerseys, probably not. Um, I actually had a case like that in New York. Um, but if you're, the criminal activity is, you know, significant drug dealing or violent activity, then that, that's probably something that's going to fall into that category. But I would say, you know, stuff that's sort of like minor criminal activity, nonviolent criminal activity is probably not something that's really going to be there um, or something that's really going to constitute an imminent threat. Okay, cool. Um, if the landlord is on the property for non-essential reasons, what are my rights during COVID? Does property include outdoor space as well as inside the home? Does the landlord need to give notice for being on property just as they do for access to inside due to repairs? My landlord is on site often without prior notice and is not mindful of six feet. Yeah, so if it's like, um, it really, it, this can get really kind of, yucky um depending when you have these kind of like for example shared communal spaces and exactly what is the right of the landlord to actually go to those um, and it really depends on how the actual layout of the place for example if you have live in a rooming house where there's four people who share a kitchen um, but they all have their own individual rooms you know, likely in that scenario the landlord always has to give some type of prior notice which usually has to be 48 hours notice and they Really, it's to inspect the property or to showcase the property, and it always has to be reasonable. And one of the basic reasons for not giving or in, um, a request to, or an unreasonable access is for something that's non-essential, non-urgent during a pandemic like this, so that if your landlord is asking for access to the property right now, I think you are within your rights to say it's unreasonable under just general state law for the landlord to ask for or request access at this point. Um, because it's basically one violating the public health um, guidelines, violating the stay at home order and the non essential activities orders, and that actually access to the property right now is probably um, an unreasonable request by the landlord. When it comes to like outdoor, outdoor areas as well, it really depends on the circumstances. I mean, if you have, like, for example, when you rent out a property, if you like rent out the single family home, I would say, yeah, the landlord generally coming into the activity, I mean, stepping, you know, going to an area that the public generally has access to, like going up to your front door where the mailman's able to go and everybody else who maybe wants to ring your doorbell, probably not an improper inspection or improper entry. Um, but actually sort of, if it's sort of like going to the backyard or into some shared space that not everybody has public access to, it's probably a problem. But then on the issue of COVID and the stay at home orders, it gets a little more complicated. Generally, the governor has basically said, especially with real estate viewings right now, for example, if your landlord wanted to sell the home, real estate viewings are allowed right now under the governor's orders. There are some restrictions, for example, it's supposed to be no more than two people at any time um, doing the viewing. So in most cases, that's going to be the realtor and the potential one buyer. Um, unless if there's a couple, they need to basically exchange or have only one person in at that time. And then there's an added complication. If you're the tenant and you're living in that place, what are you supposed to do? And the short answer is I don't have a direct answer for that. I mean, the one thing I'd probably recommend is for you to call the attorney general office about it. Just as much as they enforce the general moratorium on evictions, they also enforce the stay at home orders and the non-essential activities orders. So you definitely want to sort of, it's a case by case scenario. 
I think if you're especially somebody who's vulnerable right now, you probably do have some right to be able to restrict or defer at least the time that the building is being showcased. The other hand, the governor has very explicitly said that people are allowed to continue showcasing homes for the purpose of trying to drain financial assets, given a lot of the financial weight people have on them. So I think it's about something about trying to find a middle ground for the most part, because we have two different rights and interests right now that are competing. Well, personally, I think the public health one is probably the most important one. We do have competing orders right now to try to work with and try to figure out something. So that's a long-winded answer to say, <laughs> probably talk to the attorney general about it, and there's a lot of case-by-case -case, um, analysis mm -hmm. that would have to be done. Okay. Is it reasonable for a tenant to say they can't engage in the payment plan discussion right now, but to talk again in a month? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. I, I think June 4th is really our cutoff at this point. Um, I think the, you have like kind of a window right now, at least that's the way I read the moratorium or at least the order right now. They kind of give you June 4th to sort of gradually get to up to speed to some, a place where you can offer something that's reasonable. After June 4th, it gets a little bit hard to say is how long is the landlord supposed to wait? I think arguably not long at all from the tenant. Um, if the tenant doesn't really engage much in it or can't really offer much of anything at that point. So right now, if you get an email from your landlord or you contact your landlord and say, look, I don't have a job right now. I'm thinking things might be a little bit different a month from now. I'll get in contact with you then. I think you're okay at that point. I think that if you start the process kind of later in the game, that's totally fine. I don't recommend though starting it on June 4th though. I do think you should kind of want to have some good faith effort by that point and start being you're really kind of getting in contact with your landlord. If, for example, though, you're paying rent right now, you're not having a problem, you're not going to have a problem with May's rent, and then June 1st comes around and then you say, oh, wait a second, I'm not really ready for it. I think being late at that point is fine, um, but because you are going to be protected with June's rent at that time. So for assuming June's rent is due on the 1st or before the 4th, um, so I think engaging later on that time is fine, but I would really try to urge anyone to just at least be in contact with your landlord at this point. So just let them know what's going on, what you're thinking at this point. Even if you don't have a lot to offer, just let them know that you are thinking about this and you're trying to figure out a solution too. I think it's gonna help you later if you find that you can't come to an agreed upon payment plan at that point, that you were really being on top of it and proactive. Can you speak? more to the inclusion of language that recur requires the payment plan to be reasonable and what powers this gives tenants to negotiate one that works for them? Well, it gives a lot of power to the tenant um, because it's supposed to be individualized and in, I think it was, although you could probably pull up the language, um, it's supposed to be based on the individual financial health, which actually, let's see if I can pull it for that. Maybe you can just read it all together. So it specifically says that the repayment plan that was reasonable based on the individual financial health, well, financial comma health and other circumstances of that resident. There is, the defense attorney in me thinks that there is a ton to work with in that um, because of just, it's a beautiful little sentence and as far as, you know, as I'm concerned. Um, because it seems to say that the landlord needs to be considering all of those things. So first of all, the financial, um, situation of the tenant, the health of the tenant at that time. So for example, if you're somebody who, even after June 4th, I think everyone, it's very likely we're still going to be in the middle of all this. And if you're somebody, for example, who would have had the option to work but for the fact that you're in a vulnerable class of persons um, due to this pandemic, I think that's also another excuse at that point to not exactly having an ability to pay at that point, or at least as rapidly as possible. And then we have the general cause of other circumstances of the person. So if there's other things that we haven't even really necessarily thought of that are sort of causally related to all of this, to the COVID crisis, something else that's going along, that gives you a lot to work with as the tenant to be able to sort of discuss things and really kind of bring your own individual circumstances to the, fr um, to the front to be able to talk to the landlord about it. Um, so it gives you a lot of power. I think the most important thing, again, as I've said, is the worst decision you can make right now is to just not even deal with it, like not talk to your landlord about it. It's not an excuse to do that. I think that's how somebody with a really great situation in the sense that they're very sympathetic, they have, they really are 
definitely among the target population that is really trying to be protected by this order is if you don't engage, if that person doesn't engage at all um, by June 4th or so, and the landlord has been like emailing and texting saying, hey, like just let me know what's going on and I'll work with you. And that person refuses to engage at all. I think that person is going to have a problem down the road. And so I think that's the one thing a tenant could do wrong right now is refusing to engage at all. Okay, cool. So next question. What if landlords aren't making required repairs? Tenants are having electrical issues and contacted SDCI, but they're not doing inspections now. Yeah, that can be... It's hard. We've gotten a few calls about that. I mean, sometimes it's just about trying to coordinate with the landlord about what's the best way to get some type of repair into the done during this time, especially when that's going to follow some of the public health guidelines and other orders on it. Because a lot of ways, in the same way that a landlord shouldn't just be necessarily coming into your place to do any type of inspection just because if it's not urgent, it can also be sometimes hard to get a landlord to do any type of urgent inspections because they're finding the same problem. They can't get contractors. They can't get their own people there. They are also maybe part of the subject vulnerable population that doesn't necessarily want to go into a place either and be having as much contact with you as maybe you don't want to have with them. So we're kind of trying to sort of work with this issue right now. It's been a little bit tricky. Uh, to be able to try to get those urgent repairs that need to be done. They are still an obligation of the landlord, nonetheless. I mean, I think there might be some legal excuses or legal things that folks, the landlord maybe can definitely impose, which is they just can't address the issue right now um, because of the fact that really it's just hard to be able to do almost anything at this point. Um, so it's potentially the case you might have a reduction in rent going forward if you actually haven't been able to get the repair done. But as far as like getting the urgent issue achieved, that which is how do I get my repair done right now, there is, I'm going to disappoint you, no easy answer. The best thing to do right now is to try to engage with the landlord. If you haven't heard from anything, you can definitely contact our office. We can try to reach out. Um, and if DCI, if you live in Seattle, it's certainly the place to go for that type of work. You know, to what extent um, anyone's going to be able to really force anyone's hand at that can be a little bit tricky at this point. Um, you could definitely still, if you think it's an issue of retaliation, definitely contact the Attorney General about it um, and see if there's anything that they would be able to do on as far as being able to sort of address that outstanding issue. Cool. Um, can you talk a little bit about the clause in the moratorium that protects tenants who have to move out prior to their tenancy expiring if it's for COVID related reasons. Does that prevent landlords from collecting the rent for the rest of the lease? Yeah, it seems to provide an excuse um, for the tenant basically, but the way, yeah, I mean, I had a couple different readings of this at the time of it. Um, but basically it seems to say that as soon as like, if there is a reason why the, the tenant had to, for example, break the lease due to the COVID related reason, um, that it's a basis for them to basically get out of the lease. I wish again, it was a little more clear about what it was exactly trying to do. It does seem to say though, um, that basically if a tenant, um, was not able to occupy and I think the most common scenario we've seen is college students who ended up having to break their leases at that time. It seems to get there. I just wish it was a little bit clearer. I think the attorney general might, is probably going to take a pretty expansive view to say that if a tenant basically had to break a lease during the or due to the COVID out, outbreak that they're probably going to be allowed to not have to um, pay any rent for that time period and be able to terminate the lease early without penalty at that point. Okay, cool. Um, okay, there was another question about how to push for further protections locally. We'll, let's touch on that towards the end. Um, okay, so what about nuisance laws? Say for a domestic violence victim and having the police called, can they, can they meaning I guess the landlords, use that as a health and safety eviction? So I'm sorry, like a DV victim? Like somebody is a DV survivor. Or there's, there's some sort of, uh, and this is my assumption of what this uh, specifically, if there's more clarification, please let me know, um, whoever asked this question. Um, if like the domestic, if there's like a domestic violence incident in a home, mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, the police get called and like the DV survivors, this is the person in the home, can the landlord evict the tenant? Uh, no. I, so there's already general protections for DV survivors. I mean, if the, the, the landlord was trying to use it against the actual perpetrator of the violence, so if there was somebody there who was perpetrating violence, I think that would fall into the exception. But as far as the DV survivor, um, even outside the moratorium, there are general protections for people who are reporting issues due to being victims of domestic violence that would be protected anyways. So it shouldn't be a basis for an eviction here. So what is the chance of rent forgiveness happening? Even with payment plans, some people will not be able to catch up. I don't know. Uh, that's a political question um, um, more than anything else. Um, you know, I, I would probably have told you at least a few weeks ago, I thought maybe we were going to have be better situated as far as being able to take the easier political route, which is um, providing rental assistance for people. But it doesn't seem like that's really necessarily going to be likely. Um, absent some kind of federal intervention. And so that we are going to be faced with this issue if we're seeing a slew of people who are both even after the moratorium lifts, after the stay-at-home order lifts, when people could go back to work, if there's no, we don't know whether there's going to be jobs available for those persons who were forced to be out of work. And we don't know if they're going to be able to pay the rent and what are we going to do and how many, is that going to be a substantial number of people enough? And I say that not to, to belittle the few people that it does happen to. What I mean is, is it going to be enough that actually really state government and local governments take notice of it? And it's hard to say at this point. And I, I say personally, from my viewpoint, I think it is going to be pretty bad. And so something needs to be done. We need to, if we don't get that kind of federal intervention, we don't have that rental assistance there, we are probably going to have to figure out what's the substantive legal change that we're going to make. Is that going to be some type of level of, of you know, reducing the remedies a landlord would have available? For example, limiting their right to be able to evict for any type of rent that's accrued during this time period. Is it going to be something that's as large as a rent cancellation? Um, which is not just a political issue, but also potentially has some legal consequences too. So in trying to figure out what's the remedy that we can use to be able to address the problem and try and find out how do we reduce the overall impact, that's going to be, I think, a hard question uh, that we're all going to be faced with. Yeah. Okay. What about if rent strikers are demanding that the landlord negotiates collectively with them? Can they refuse individualized negotiations? What happens in this type of situation? So I, I don't think a landlord can refuse to individually assess people. I think that's, that's basically the criteria. No, I'm saying or, if tenants want it to be a collective negotiation instead of an individual one. They could. Um, I suppose tenants could ask for that. Um, uh, it's not strictly, I mean, it's definitely not prohibited within the actual order. And I suppose it is possible if all the tenants collectively did agree to do something like that. It might be then enforceable down the road um, as, as far as if the landlord wanted to say that, you know, I didn't do individualized um, agreements because the whole tenant association wanted us to deal with everybody in block. I don't know exactly how a court would treat that. I don't, but I kind of would think that if people engaged in good faith and said, look, we want to do this all as a tenant association with the landlord, I have a feeling a court is going to say that was enough for the landlord to comply. The fact that you willfully or willingly just said, I wanted to delegate my power to a collective bargaining unit um, to be able to do this, and I will waive that right to have an individualized plan. I think if that later it turns out the landlord can't get to that individualized plan, the collective bargaining breaks down. I don't know exactly how a court, if what a court would say, you know, does the landlord still then have to engage with people individually at that point, or do they actually have to, can they just go ahead with the collection or eviction? It's hard for me to say. I don't, um, I'm not sure if, how often that will happen, but if it does happen, I think it would be kind of a novel issue at least, and there might be a lot of circumstantial questions there. Yeah, one thing I just wonder about, like I, in situations that in that don't have this kind of moratorium, I understand why it's really important for tenants to negotiate collectively because you have more power.
But I do wonder because the landlords are required to give reasonable payment plans, if it would be wise to do that, just because I like, what if you have a tenant because who have very different financial situations and I worry about like whatever is like one agreement might not work for everyone and that the people who are the most in the most financial precar precarious situation might get screwed. So I think that's something to think about. Um, okay. So the next question is your message is very encouraging because this moratorium sounds pro tenant. Um, I think so. Uh, I will say, I think people should definitely be giving the governor's office a lot of props. Uh, I heard that there were some staff members who um, their personal cell phones were given out by the landlord lobbyists to landlords. So they were inundated with angry landlords, hundreds of angry landlords to their personal cell phones, and they still went ahead with this moratorium. So um, definitely give them props. Um, okay, uh, is the landlord lobby uh, saying the opposite, that this is not pro tenant? Are they gearing up to pounce once the moratorium is lifted on June 4th? Um, well, I don't know exactly what they're saying. I haven't really heard too much from them. Um, as far as what how they're interpreting this, I think obviously they're not happy with it from the little I have heard about it. Uh, I don't know. I mean, if I was a landlord right now, and I or I was a landlord association, I would be telling all of the landlords like you need to start engaging with your tenants on this payment plan right now and start talking to them and start the conversations at this point. Um, that that would be the best way to start coping with this. If you really, there are holes in this, if you really wanted to exploit it, um, but they're, I'm not sure if they're really even looking to do that right now, or at least anyone who's, I think, really would be capable of doing that. Um, but as far as, you know, as far as I know, at least from, if I was on their side, I would be trying to, you do what this thing is telling me to do, which is engage with the tenants. If I find later that they're not, if I'm not getting that engagement back or the tenant's not working with me as a landlord, I would probably say then, yeah, after June 4th, absent some type of intervention, you could probably start moving forward on the process at that point. Um, so I think they really, I think they don't really want to look like the bad actor right now to the extent that they can. They really want to make tenants to be the bad actor. They want to make, they want to be able to show that they're trying to work on this thing. It's tenants who are refusing to work with it. Um, I think that's their game right now is to try to not get the PR bad or the bad PR on them. It's to try to say, how do we move it to the other side? How do we make it so that we're the ones who are hurting? We're the ones who are being impacted here. So I think that's the game they want to play. Whether that translates to necessarily them trying to act really quickly on evictions on June 4th, I can't say. In some ways, it's not always, it's not a great look either for them to be too aggressive, but um, it's, you know, landlords can be hit or, all over the place in my experience. Yeah. Okay, so there's like a handful of people on the phone. So if you are on the phone and you want to ask a question, you can unmute yourself by hitting star six. Um, and I'll wait like just a couple seconds to see if there's anyone who wants to. Okay, I don't see anybody making, I don't see anybody doing that. Okay, so Ed, why don't you continue for on the post moratorium piece? So this is just gonna be a very quick thing uh, just on like, what are your rights now? So there's been a lot of legal changes in the last year or so um, to the eviction process. And I just sort of want to update people on them. Some of them well known, some not so well known. And just sort of explain like, let's say you're in this part, <laughs> you're in this process, let's, you know, it's really, you've gone the back and forth with the landlord and it's kind of clear it's not working out for whatever reason. And maybe we have a better idea of what a reasonable payment plan is at that time. So the landlord's just, we, at this point, the landlord is allowed to proceed with the eviction. So what do you do? What do you need to know? Or what would I at least want you to know um, at that point? And the question, the, the sort of it is, Evictions are fairly straightforward proceedings. They are not pretty. Um, if you're somebody who hasn't been through them before, I think sometimes, you know, a lot of my clients that I see, they are very surprised at how quick the process goes. 
And in particular, that they don't really have that right to a full jury trial, for example, or really have a lot of um, the kind of access to the justice that they were, were expecting. But the short of it, just really quickly to go through it in case you're not aware, is that the eviction process starts usually with a predicate notice. I can think of one exception when it does not, but usually your landlord is gonna send you a piece of paper that won't, may or may not be from an attorney. Um, but basically it's gonna be usually posted on your door and mailed is the most common way you get it. You shouldn't get it electronically. It, they can send it to you by email, but they still have to either post it on your door and mail it. They can also give it to you personally or give it to somebody of suitable age at your home. But that notice is really telling you what the whole thing is about. What is the land? Why is the landlord trying to evict you? The most common one is rent, and that's they have to give you 14 days with that notice. So after you get it, you get 14 days to pay or get out. You also have a breach of lease. So if you have a dog you're not supposed to have, or you have a guest you're not supposed to have, that could be a 10-day notice usually. Um, it's really just saying get rid of the dog or get out. Get rid of the guest or get out. The other two common ones are a three-day notice for waste. So if you're you know, cause the fire or significant damage to the property or other like nuisance, violent activity, for example, that would be, that's just saying to you as a tenant, get out. You have three days to get out or I'm starting the case because of sort of the nuisance or um, activity that you're, is going on. It usually has to be pretty egregious activity. Um, and then the other one that tends to come up is the 20 day notice. Some cities have longer notices. They go up to 60 days. Sometimes the lease actually provides for a 30 day notice or longer, but most, at least the general default rule is that if you're a month to month tenant or your lease is expiring um, and the lease says so, you have to be given 20 days notice to basically be told to get out. Realistically though, the earliest anybody should be getting this 20 day notice is probably June 30th. Most tenancies, if you're month to month and you're going you know, every month and it's, you, know, you pay your rent on the first of the month, the first time the landlord's gonna be able to give you one of these 20 day notices is after June 4th. And the earliest they could really ask you to get out is June 30th. So you're gonna at least be in the clear if you're a month to month tenant till July 1st at this point, just logically. Um, unless you're somebody who's got a really kind of weird lease that starts on like the, I don't know, the 28th of the month or something, um, which does happen. Uh, and then if, let's say the predicate knows, so you didn't pay your rent in the 14 days, what happens? Well, then at that point, you get a summons and complaint. It's basically the landlord saying, I'm going to take you to court. It's not the case that after the 14 days are up that the sheriff's going to come over and lock you out, or the, the landlord's going to come and change the locks and force you out. That's illegal. There's no um, illegal lockouts for the most part in Washington. Um, but then you get the summons and that's going to ask you to respond. The most common way to respond is just to send your landlord or the attorney a piece of paper that says, I got your summons, I'm going to fight you in court and just gives a mailing address to where uh, they can send any future paperwork. Usually you get a court date in the mail at that point and at that court date, it's going to be sort of like a daytime court TV hearing. Um, it's not a very, well, you pretty much, the landlord tells their side of the case, you tell your side of the case. And if, for example, at this point, you did not get any type of payment plan and they're suing you over debt that is through June 4th, you could potentially raise it here. I am a little bit uncertain, though, about something that I know is going to happen, which is a lot of tenants, if you were to, let's say, your landlord engaged in the process after June 4th, you find yourself getting a 14-day notice because you couldn't come to that reasonable payment plan, then you don't have July's rent and we have our court date in July. I know, I know that this is what the landlord attorneys are going to do. And I know that because this is what I would do is I would say, yeah, we didn't give a payment plan for the like June 4th or whatnot, but they also owe other money as well. They owe money for July and that July is not covered by the governor's moratorium. In that order, we don't have to provide a payment plan for. So we're not necessarily going to seek it there. So they're going to potentially could seek and try to amend the complaint and whatnot against you to be able to reflect that July's rent where they don't actually have to provide a payment plan. Um, so just key, be on the lookout. I just really, if we start getting later in the summer, and let's say you do a rent that's good from June 4th, um, but you also owe July's rent, you owe August's rent, no, you might have some problems even though the, land, the tenant never engaged you, in, or I'm sorry, the landlord never engaged you in that payment plan if you start owing July's rent or August's rent because they don't have to with those months, at least not under the according to the certain order. Just saying that I just flagged this for the potential fire that might be coming down the pipeline. Um, and I wanna make sure that we avoid as much as possible on that. So just 
don't be overly confident. The point is be prepared. The worst thing can still happen at that point. There, are, will, there might be some legal issues there, but we can work it out. Usually at the court hearing, if the landlord says you owe, or I'm sorry, the judge finds that you owe rent, um, you are going to find that you're potentially going to be evicted a week after. You get a sheriff's notice usually the day after that hearing. It might be a little bit longer depending on where you are. And you could be out usually within five court days or a week afterwards. So it's quick proceeding. Most people get evicted for about a month or less in rent. They usually get evicted within two months of owing the rent. Um, so it's generally happens very fast. And sometimes that's surprising to people if you're not aware of it. Again, it's a new day. It's going to be a new situation, new economy coming down the summer if this all gets lifted on June 4th. Um, so it's hard to say what's going to happen at that point. So the two things I really just want you to know, though, um, is the even if you gauge in this payment plan, no, nothing's working out, you just didn't have the ability to pay, or maybe you did get a payment plan and then you defaulted on it really quickly for whatever reason. I just want you to know this is something that's in the new laws that kind of was buried there, but now is a lot clearer, especially after this last session. So the most common case, the most common case that people are going to actually be dealing with is the rent case, which is you get a 14 days, you have 14 days to pay the rent. If you pay the rent on that sort of bottom left step there and you pay the rent within the 14 days of getting that notice, the case is done. That's all you have to do. And notably, it doesn't include any late fees. You don't have to pay any kind of notice fees, no attorney's fees, no court costs. The only thing you pay is rent. And rent is whatever is a recurring payment that you would have to make. So. If you pay a, um, a pet charge every month, you would have to include that. If you pay utilities, that has to be included as well. But if you also, like, but those one-time fees that sort of just come out, they're non-recurring, those late fees that just kind of get slapped on you, that does not have to be paid. You do not, you cannot be evicted for failing to pay late fees, notice fees, attorney's fees, et cetera. What happens though after the 14 days really is not that you can't pay at that point to stop the case, is that the landlord is allowed to, after the 14 days, start a summons against you. That's basically it, or starting a formal eviction case in court against you. But you can still stop it, and the only thing you have to do is pay rent plus a late fee of up to $75, and that's only if the lease provides it. So if your lease says that you have to pay $150 a month, well, you only have to pay $75 of that doesn't mean you don't owe the $150, but you only to be able to stop the eviction, keep your housing, the only thing you have to pay is the rent that you owe plus the $75. Just know that if you go into a new month, you would potentially have to pay that rent for the new month as well to be able to do this. If the case gets, if you get served with a summons or the case is filed in court, you might have to pay some court costs that have incurred at that time. It's hard for you to know that as a tenant. You have to contact the landlord or their attorney. And if you go all the way to judgment, and you owe more than two months of rent or more than $1,200, whichever is greater, you could potentially have to pay the attorney's fees and you have only five court days to do so at that point. My point of showing this to you though, is that even if you can't pay in the 14 days and a lot of managers will give you wrong information, they'll say, we can't pay it, we can't accept your money because we've sent it off to our lawyer or whatever. They have to actually accept the money. That's what this graph is showing you. Um, and it's pretty clearly in the law that they have to do it. So I just want you to keep this in mind in the worst case scenario down the road, whether it's three, four months from now, is that even if you still have some options, even if you can't pay after you've done that payment plan option and it didn't work out, or even if you got the 14 day notice and it didn't work out, you still have some options. And even if that doesn't work out, there's one last thing, which is you can still ask the court up until the time you're actually evicted, you can ask the court to help you um, to give you up to three months potentially to be able to pay off the back balance. Um, this is assuming there's no other legal changes going on. That could be out of pocket, could be through a charity. Um, there's also something called the Tenancy Preservation Program slash Landlord Mitigation Fund. That's a fund that actually also is available for tenants that it will actually pay off everything. So really it's like you go to court and you potentially could be evicted. You could ask the judge to, um, you could say, look, judge, I fell behind hard times due to COVID, et cetera. I can't pay anything right now. It's possible the judge and its discretion could just ask the state of Washington to pay it off for you. And that's one way to get there. I, you know, this is going to be a long time, I think, for anyone's actually having to deal with this. But 
something if you want to call my office about, if you have more, want more information about, um, but also if you kind of further down the road, if you find you're really just, things are not working out four to five months from now, this is something to be thinking about at least. Um, the one thing I, I'll just note on that is that you can't, technically access this if you have three payer vacates in the last year or the last 12 months. Um, that said though, I mean, if your landlord is willing to work with you and they just want to get paid, they can definitely waive that um, restriction on it. And that in a nutshell is the eviction process really quickly. So any questions or about anything else? Okay, so one thing I just want to really make sure folks know is that, you know, local cities um, have a lot of, they have a lot of freedom to pass stronger tenant protections. Um, you know, there's been court cases that have basically said cities can create defenses to eviction, um, among other things. And so, you know, for folks who want to, um, who are either perhaps connected to local government or um want to push their legislators i think the thing to think about is you know getting funding for rental assistance or even pushing to cancel rent i think are very both are just very difficult things that um is is going to be harder for local cities to do but it's not going to be hard for them to create more legal protections that um, prevent people from getting evicted. So really just, you know, support those efforts. If you're interested in, in, in those things, I would definitely contact, you know, people like Ed and, and other folks um, on that. So there's one last question um, about the tenants. To, okay, question. Okay, there's two questions. Okay. Um, question about tenants demanding collective bargaining. If the tenant association demanded collective negotiations and refused to negotiate individually, would that allow the landlord to evict? Hey, each of these tenants refused to talk to me individually. So clear, uh, tenants collecting, if the tenants, sorry, I'm just thinking about this. If the tenant association demanded collective. Um, I don't, I don't think so. I, I would, if I was a landlord or their attorney advising them, I would really think do not think that just because the you got approached by a group of tenants that that gives you license to go ahead and evict them i i would really be hard pressed um again i think this is like sort of a complicated scenario that's not really clearly contemplated in the moratorium that if the if a group of tenants did ask to do that i mean i think it would be a really good idea for the landlord to be willing to engage them together um and even if that even those talks break down and it doesn't really work, that the landlord would still make at least some effort to even reach out to people individually if it doesn't work out. Um, that's what I think is a reasonable expectation or reasonable actions by the landlord at that point. Um, but I think just merely the fact that the, a group of tenants come to them and the landlord says, wait a second, you guys aren't engaging with me individually. Well, the, the idea is that the landlord has to engage with them individually and, and I think in light of their circumstances, it's not the other way around. It's not that the tenants have to individually engage with the landlord, um, at least as individuals. I think they could probably do it as a group. But as far as like what happens like down the road if things really don't work out, I think that's sort of remains to be seen. Yeah, and I, again, I understand, like, you know, when you're not under this moratorium and landlords have a lot more leverage than tenants, you have a lot of benefit to doing some sort of collective, like, agreement or something along those lines. But given the way that this moratorium works and how the payment plans are supposed to be reasonable to the individual situations, I do think that it is something to, to think about. Because if you have people, if you have, like, a 90-person building, I can't imagine it's going to be easy to come up with a, plan, a one universal plan that works for everyone. And also, just to be honest, it's going it's going to be a lot harder for the landlords to come up with individual payment plans. So I feel like to make people's lives harder, our landlords, I think that's something to think about. Um, but anyway, um, then last question, and if 
folks have some more, feel free to put them in. Um, if there was an eviction prior to COVID, so I'm assuming if there's an eviction ordered prior to COVID, how soon can one be evicted after June 4th? Yeah, I mean, the, the, probably the short answer is June 4th, but working on the assumption that there was already an order from the court and the tenant was supposed to be evicted before June 4th, then the only restriction would potentially be that June 4th, that person could be evicted. Um, so it's definitely possible. How likely that it is, I can't say. I will say one thing that is likely to also happen is let's say you had, a, you had an order to be evicted that comes back from early March and you were supposed to, for example, be out by the end of March at that time. Uh, probably writs time out unless there's absent some other uh, part of the order after 20 days typically. So they have to, the landlord is going to have to go back to court and get the writ renewed. And generally right now, the courts are not hearing anything for the most part until after March or until after May 4th. That said though, I mean, the circumstance can really depend on a lot of things, but the short of it is though, I think in the worst case scenario, that person could potentially be evicted on June 4th. Okay, so, okay. Um, all right, so I don't think there are any more, or okay, one more question. <laughs> feel, feel free to keep on asking questions because, you know, I don't know, we get time. Um, based on the lack of clarity about rent increases, if we received a notice of a rent increase on March 2nd, with the increase going into effect on May 1st, is it reasonable to withhold the increase saying we need to wait for more clarity? I, I would contact the attorney general now about it. I think you have some time. I have a feeling they're going to issue some guidance on this or some expectation about it. You might even find, for all we know, that Governor Inslee issues a tweet that actually says very specifically, um, it's his order, and he's the route, I think, basically, doing, he's the has the best right of anyone to actually interpret what he meant. Um, so I, I don't know if I would necessarily, you know, it doesn't hurt to, honestly, it doesn't hurt you to actually withhold part of the increase because there's nothing really would happen. You can't be asked to pay late fees or whatnot. You can't be forced out and technically nothing can be treated as unpaid until they've offered you a payment plan. So it's not, I can't say it's like a bad idea to withhold it at that point. Um, the one thing though is just keep in mind, I, we don't know what it's going to be like. I mean, right now the power has definitely shifted the tenants. I might, I would just caution, um, to the extent that it's possible one day that power shift is going to go back. I mean, in my view, a lot of landlords have most of the power here under the current laws, um, under the general default laws in Washington. And all this order shifts the power balance. When it goes back, you've got to understand it could potentially what your circumstances are, your vulnerability, it could have a negative impact. So if it's about you don't want to pay the increase because you can't afford it, that's one thing. I would definitely just caution, like, if it's mostly about trying to work something out though with the landlord about trying to figure out what the rent's going to be in the future, instead of just outright withholding it, I would just engage with some kind of conversation with them. But it's again, it's up to you. I can't say that it would have negative legal consequences right now either though. Yeah. And yeah. so, I mean, it sounds like if, and it sounds like if people are thinking that their landlord might be violating the, or, the, the order, like contact the attorney general. Um, I know they're, paying a lot of close attention to this. And the, the other thing is my guess after, you know, not only did a lot of organizations, you know, ad, including I'm sure many on this call, like advocate for a lot of those changes. I think the fact that the attorney general got so many complaints sort of revealing how predatory some landlords are really helped this get put into effect. Um, so, just keep that in mind. So I really encourage people to contact the attorney general. Okay, another question. Can the landlord start the negotiations or payment plans before June 4th? Yeah, there's nothing that restricts them from not engaging in the process right now. So it does seem like they can engage in it uh, um, at this point. The one thing is, I, again, I don't like the way it's worded because it says, like it says the landlord in the first part of the paragraph says landlord cannot treat as unpaid and then pursue any type of collection um, until June 4th, basically. It doesn't say that, um, but until June 4th. But then it, then the last sentence is like, well, this doesn't apply though if the landlord is engaged in, and provided some kind of payment plan. So it almost sounds like the landlord can start collection even before June 4th, uh, which I don't love. I don't think that's not from what the attorney general has told me is what their intent was, but the way it actually reads is a little bit 
um, sloppy. Um, so it kind of can get you into some, it does seem to suggest to the landlord that they could potentially engage in a payment plan right now. And then once they've offered it and they've gotten to that individualized payment plan, if they really feel comfortable with it, they could potentially start a collection activity, not an eviction, but collection um, before then. So that is, so it's not assumed to be harassment or threats if the landlord's asking to engage in the payment plans? No, I don't think so. Not at this point. I mean, it's possible the attorney general could be take a different view of it. Um, I know they've taken a much broader, more expansive view, both of this order and the prior one, than I, I think, at least even I even read into it. Um, but that's, I mean, they might see it that way, that you're not even supposed to engage until it after June 4th. But just strictly when I read the text itself, the only thing I see is it's nothing prohibiting the landlord from now engaging on that process right now. And it would probably behoove the landlord to do so right now because they can actually start doing collections activity, if not even after they offer the payment plan, but even potentially definitely after June 4th, if they've engaged in that process. And the payment plan has to be reasonable to the tenant, not the landlord. Correct. Yeah. So that's definitely... Well, I think a lot of people are worried about talking to their landlords generally. I think this might be a different situation. Yeah, I, I guess I would say like, it's supposed to be based on the individual finances and health and other circumstances of the tenant. I would say the reasonableness though, does imply that the landlord does have some interest in what it can crafting it and what it would actually be it's just not it's definitely not in itself a factor or a strong factor by any means cool yeah all right are there any more questions thoughts concerns etc um not seeing any so um, I put in the chat the link to the Google form if you um, did not sign up through that uh, Google form um, please do so so I can have your email and I will send you both this PowerPoint which um, I will also admit that for the first like minute I forgot to hit the record button so it starts like like a minute late but I think that'll be fine and um, I'll also send you the links and just want to emphasize that the federal moratorium is in effect and it goes on much longer and if you're on a um, uh, uh, if you're living in a, an apartment building or multifamily building, you should definitely check because you have a good shot of being covered. So someone is asking how you, Ed, do you do paid consult consultation? No, I, no. So you can, I'm a free attorney. Um, so you can contact the housing justice project. You leave a voicemail there or you can email us and then we'll have an attorney myself or somebody else contact you. Yeah, I'd be really broke if Ed cost money for his <laughs> consultations. Um, okay, so yeah, and I, I think there is a link for the Housing Justice Project in the chat as well, but again, I'll send this out. And uh, that's it. So thank you and have a good rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks.